Hi, my name is Gerald Powell, and I am at the Laboratory Genetics of the Salk Institute. And today I'll tell you guys about uh, nonlinear time series analysis. And this is a form of analysis that differs markedly from statistics, which is what most people are familiar with. Uh, this is a form of applied nonlinear dynamics in chaos theory. And um, I'll present you three main tools, and I hope you enjoy this lecture on nonlinear time series analysis using empirical dynamical modeling. So this is basically a way to look at uh, data, I mean especially time series data, without using equations. And I'll explain in a little bit why you want to use uh, modeling without equations. So you want to start with this place. Um, I will describe your typical biology experiments that most of you guys are used to. And that is using two conditions, which one will be your experimental condition, where you presumably do a perturbation. And then you have uh, your control condition. And then you sample some, the experimental condition a bunch of times and derive your error bars. And then you take your control and spend, uh, take a couple of samples, determine your statistical properties, the error bars, and then you compare the two and see if there's a difference. But this is a kind of a dangerous way to look at certain things, as if the things are dynamic. And this assumes that the system is static, it's not changing over time. It also assumes that it's equilibrium, that it's not changing. Let's say that if you sample the first um, time point or sample is the same as the next one that you sample and the third one that you sample, etc. So let me illustrate this um, in a system that is slightly dynamic. So if you actually look, we actually have these two conditions with the fish and with the sea lion. And if I were to look at a movie and the thing was really a movie and the thing is dynamic, and I took 10 frames of that first movie and 10 frames of the second movie and average them out, what you would end up getting is this blur that's a little bit orange and that blur that's a little bit brown. So you actually compare these two conditions and they say, oh, I understand the systems because I have good error bars and my thing is statistically powered and you claim to understand it. But you average out all the information and you blur it. So when you do statistics and the system is actually dynamic, then you run to this problem. This is basically what you're doing. So most of us are doing this, the lower panel. So what I'm telling you is that maybe you should take time series because if you take different time points, it's like taking frames of a movie and then you see how things are changing over time. So if it indeed doesn't change, then statistics and a static approach is appropriate. But if things are changing, then we probably shouldn't be using that. Okay, that was a philosophical thing. So what we're specifically, in terms of techniques, we're going to talk about uh, three different things, mainly. One is called Lacord Embedding and Simplex. That's, uh, the other one is called SMAP, which stands for Sequential Locally Weighted Global Linear Maps. I'll go into it in detail later. And Conversion Cross Mapping, which is a way to determine if things are causally related to each other, if they're in the dynamical system. And then finally, I'm going to briefly discuss and give you some examples of empirical dynamical modeling, which is kind of a combination using all these other tools to get a picture of what's really going on. So many of us know that correlation does not imply causation. But frequently, um, people also th say as you can read in the bottom there, empirically observed correlation is a necessary but not sufficient condition for causality. And that's actually not true. But this uh, notion is very prevalent. And as you can see, Wikipedia has it there. And there are many business books, and people actually call this like uh, 
Tufte's notion, which actually says that correlation is required for causation which is not true. And I'll give you a bunch of examples. So you should stop thinking that way. Here, I show you an example that illustrates the point that correlation does not imply causation. As you can see, these two things are very correlated. Like you have 99.26% uh, correlation. But you can clearly see these things really do not make sense and probably are not related to each other. This is what you call a um, spurious cor correlation in, you know, in common language, but some, but a technical spurious correlation is something else, and I will not talk about that. But be aware that, that there's this other thing that calls spurious correlation that is an artifact of normalization. So this is the typical thing that we think of, you know, correlation and have causation as a subset of correlation. But what I'm saying is that, uh, this is actually what I work on, is that you actually have causation that can, ha can exist in the absence of correlation. So why do we like correlation so much? And, um, and we're really good at it. So we're really good detecting correlations, but that probably has to deal with the how our brain works. And as you all know, this um, concept of heavy and learning, where you actually have neurons that fire together, wire together, you generate synapses between them, and you strengthen them. And the classical thing is classical conditioning. Uh, you remember Eric Kandel's uh, aplesia. And here you actually have when you actually fire together, you strengthen the synapses, and actually you, and this is basically the Hebbian learning model. And if you have input cell and another cell, they, if they both fire together, they strengthen the synapse, and this is how actually learning works. So basically you have a correlation detector. And if both things are coincidence, as you can see at the zero milliseconds, you generate LTP, long-term potentiation, and then you have learning. But if you separate it to the signals, like let's say uh, 10 milliseconds uh, ahead or 10 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds behind, or even 20 milliseconds, you actually have no long-term potentiation. So here is evidence that we are actually have a correlation detector. And this is basically what our brain is. It's not just a simple, but you have layers upon layers of correlation. And this is basically what we are, how our brain works. So really tuned to correlation. So here I'm showing you an example where you actually have two time series and you have certain values. These are two equations that are coupled to each other. And these are the time step steps at the bottom. So you can see they're fairly well correlated. So you could say, oh, maybe these things are, are causal to each other because they're correlated. But you look at later time points and things start not looking as good. And you can see all these points that don't match. And if you go even further, there are like certain periods where you see absolutely no correlation. But the fact is, these guys are causally related. So it depends on when you look. You might have correlation in the system or no correlation in the system. And this is what we call mirage correlation. That you actually have correlations that look like that. And then sometimes you have things that don't look. You have no correlations, but they're causally related to each other. And the reason we know for sure these are causally related because these two equations are coupled each other so the result of one go becomes an input for the other one and vice versa so the system when it's like non-linear but they feed back on, on each other you can have situations like this where you have mirage correlations where you actually have causal linkage but absence of correlation and there's, you can see there's no way you can shift these, these two curves to make those flat parts uh, align with the, um, with the ones that are called zigzagging. 
here's another example with real data. So you can see these two genes, um, it doesn't matter what they are, but you can see there's actually no correlation with the two of them. So if we would do a fit, a linear fit of the two, you can see is not very good. The R is 0 0.08, that's less than 0 0.1. Um, but look at this. So if we look at the static image and look at the left side here, you had the you see we cannot find correlation between the two. But we connect one point, let's say time point one to time point two to time point three, etc. etc. And these you can see they have a certain non-random pattern. And this is actually uh, things that evolve over the cell cycle. So these genes are connected to each other. They have a relationship, but it doesn't fit a linear fit. So these actually things, that you cannot put a line between the two and fit them onto a line. So you do not have any type of correlation, but they are actually connected to each other and you have structure and there's information. However, does this depend on time? The sequence is important. So if we were to randomize the assignment of the time points, we get all we have on the right side, which is time randomized, and you actually have, um, you have the same statistical properties, but you do not have the time component, and then you lose all semblance of structure. So many natural systems are low dimensional. And what do I mean by this? Okay, here we actually look at dynamics of population in ecology. And we have the number of links and number of snowshoe hares in Northern Canada. And if you look at this, it goes up and down and there's a predator prey interaction and you could actually describe this by two differential equations and they're with two variables and it's a two-dimensional system and it could be described by the so-called lotka volterra equation that describes the relationship of predator and prey but the point i want to make here is like although you can you can describe the relationship of the hair and the lynx just with hair and lynx you don't really need other things that the lynx requires to survive because the other things are not limiting for example we know that the lynx and the hair both need water they cannot survive without drinking obviously and they need to find mates etc but that is not limiting what determines the behavior of the lynx and the hare is the availability of prey. So the system as a whole tells you what are the limiting factors. So if this is um, determined by just one factor, in reality we know that most of the behavior is divided by three factors, which is lynx, hare, and vegetation cover. If you actually take those two or three eggs, you can have a 90 some percent uh, accurate description of the system. So those are the limiting factors and those are what determine the population. So if we were to plot one versus the other, you get this thing. The structure that tells you that when the lynx population goes up, at a certain point the hair population goes down with the and then as like the links, the, as the population of hair goes down, then the links follows because it doesn't have enough food. So you can actually see this relationship goes around this orbit. It just circles around. And this circle, the circling behavior, uh, this orbiting is what we call an attractor. The reason it's called an attractor is because it resembles like uh, gravity where which you actually attract let's say like the Sun attracts the, the the earth around and it makes an orbit and this 
a tractor, and as Marv had mentioned in the previous lecture, and when you describe it in a phase space, this is what you get. You get an attractor that orbits around this invisible point in the middle that is, uh, determines how this thing is maintained stably. So just to recapitulate, you know, biological systems display low dimensionality because dissipative systems, because they're influenced very strongly by a few factors. So a small number of differential equations could describe the overall all behavior of a system. But frequently, it's not just one or two. And sometimes, and most of the times, in an open system, and it's, co it's complex, and you may not know all the factors. So if you need to have differential equations to model them, you would need to have all the relevant factors with all the different parameters. But if you don't have those, then you're in trouble. You cannot describe the system because let's say you, you think this, the system has two factors, but in reality has five, then you're not accounting for the other three, and then your description will be very inaccurate. So there are many types of shapes of attractors, and these are uh, attractors and the shape that the trajectories make, that's what we call a manifold. These manifolds can have many different topology, and these are some, some examples that I got from the net of uh, attractor manifolds, and that's, those tells you basically a relationship of things, and these are all like three-dimensional one. But just remember, if there are more factors, there could be more dimensions, and there could be like maybe four, five, six, ten, and if you have red noise, like which is like, um, you know, temperature, Brownian motion, you can have like as many dimensions as molecules you have. So it can be very complicated. But in most cases, we care about relatively low dimensional systems, which are something between two and let's say a dozen dimensions. So here we have chaos versus noise. So if you have something like this, this is a time series of data, how do we know this is chaos or noise? So chaos, as opposed to noise, is something that is relatively low dimensional, but is high dimensional enough that it is complicated to predict. And noise is basically random, stochastic. So everything has no rules, is basically random processes, like if you had a random number generator. So in 1978, like Jim Crutchfield, in his undergraduate thesis, he came up with this thing called lack coordinate embedding. And then um, this was actually proven by Floris Tuckins in Holland. And this is sort of the basis <clears throat> of most of the things that we'll talk about today. So, lack coordinate embedding. So here we have two time series, and one I'm telling you is chaos, and the other one is noise. But how do you have a formal way to, to know which one is chaos and which one is noise? Both of them look similar and just look messy, but here we'll go about this. Okay. If we take the time point one, and then call that x, and then take time point two, and call that y, and then we have x and y, we can also call that today and tomorrow, and then we'll plot that on this two-dimensional graph, as a single uh, for a point. And then we shift over and then take time point two and call that x and then time point three we call it y and then we plot we plot it on the phase diagram. And you keep doing this. I'm going ahead of myself. You, uh, you do it for all the time points and if you have chaos 
you start seeing structure. You can see these lines here, and then um, in noise, you have no pattern whatsoever. So chaos has some kind of structure and is dependent on its history, but noise is not. So the previous value has some influence on the next value, but with noise, it doesn't. So for example, in this part of chaos, you can say, let's say if the value of today was 0.9 or so, you could predict the value of tomorrow pretty well. But let's say in these other parts where you have, for example, the value today is around here, you have all these possible values for tomorrow, these are ambiguities. And these ambiguities we call uh, singularity. So a lot of this work is try to, to resolve these singularities and you want to have as few singularities as possible. So we take this into three dimensions. Let's say we take the value of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and we plot it in three dimensional phase space. Now you actually have something that looks quite predictable. You actually eliminated a lot of singularities and you made something that is very, very predictable. And you can keep doing this with more and more dimensions. But as you can see, if you actually add dimensions to the system, I mean, I cannot draw more than three, but you can imagine those as components of a vector and in a vector space, you can have as many dimensions as you want. So you can calculate with it, but it's kind of hard to, you know, um, uh, have a mental image of it. But what you can see is like with more dimensions, at a certain point, the predictions becomes worse and worse. And the reason is because many times you're diluting good information with bad information. Let's say the relevant information, let's say when we were predicting weather, the, the weather yesterday and the weather two days ago determine very strongly what the weather will be tomorrow. But the weather 14 days ago or 10 days ago has a very little influence or completely irrelevant. So then you're diluting your good information from you know, yesterday and the day before yesterday with information that's irrelevant so your signal becomes weaker because you diluted it away. So that's why you have a best embedding dimension and the embedding dimension where you actually have the maximum predictability you know is the correct one because you know these things are not random and you actually um, get some information out of it and that's how you keep the entire thing honest so you're like trying to get everything to correspond to reality All right. so there's a so-called Whitney embedding theorem and we know that the embedding dimension E relates to the real dimensionality of the system as it's the embedding dimension is minimally equal to the dimension n, which is the real dimension of the system, and somewhere less than 2n plus 1. So let's say a real thing has three dimensions, and you come up with an embedding dimension for the system. So that is, let's say, 3. So you know this minimally three dimensions, but is less than 7. So it gives you a boundary of how complex the system. So by doing this embedding dimension, the embedding dimension gives you a rough estimate of how complex the system is. So using something like what I told you before, you can do a projection of the future. So you saw that um, we actually had uh, 
a map a couple of slides ago. So you can actually follow, let's say you were to follow these over time, like from one value to the other as a time series. And then you have this map and it says, okay, my current time point is this and the nearest neighbors in space and that face space and that in that uh, volume that I had were these guys, these three guys. So in the future time point, which is like yt plus one, which were the previous nearest neighbors? So if we had the nearest the nearest neighbors on the on the last iteration, I'm gonna predict the next time point is gonna have somewhere in the middle of these guys. So that's what you call the simplex projection. So you generate a map, and with the map that you generated, you actually have all the points and all the histories and the points in multi-dimensional space and with your embedding, and then you predict based on previously where did it go, the next time is gonna go pretty close to where it went before. So this system, this entire business requires stationarity. And by stationarity, that all that it means is the system is not drifting into a different state. So your observation, you know, the history, and your future observations should be part of the same system and not changing into a completely different state. So the typical way that you would do something like this to test how, uh, you know, whether your stuff is working. So you have a library that you do, let's say your lag core embedding, you take half of the time course, and this time series, and then you try to forecast what happens in the second half. And this is a nice way to, um, to test if your, if your library is good, if this method is adequate for predicting. And predicting is the main tool that we use to, um, to test if the model is correct. So here I'll show you a video. Oops, somehow it didn't work here. Let me see. Okay, this video shows you the Lorenza tractor. And the Lorenza tractor is determined by those three differential equations there. And as you can see, if you run it over time, it has it generates this manifold. And the manifold is the shape. But if you can see on one side, although here Z and X are negatively correlated, but in another low, uh, X and Z are positively correlated. So you actually have situations where this have, has no cor the correlation changes. So the manifold, all that it is, is time series projection into into state space. So if you took all three X, Y, Z the solutions and you run it into time series, all that you get and you project it back. That's the, uh, that's the manifold. So you can take a manifold and make a, a time series out of them. And you can also do the reverse. You can take time series and reconstruct a manifold. So this goes back and forth smoothly. So as long as you can have a manifold, you can generate time series and vice versa. That's the important take home message. single most important concept of this uh, lecture, and that is Takens theorem. So Takens theorem so shows generically that if you have a manifold, which was like I show you from a Lorenz attractor, that shape made out of several variables, uh, three different differential equations, you could actually take any one of them, you could actually generate a shadow manifold by a trick uh, of using delays, 
And the new manifold that you generate have preserved many of the essential properties of the original manifold. And I'll illustrate that in the following video. There's a very powerful theorem proven by Floris Takens that shows generically that one can reconstruct a shadow version of the original manifold simply by looking at one of its time series projections. For example, consider the three time series shown here. These are all copies of each other. They are all copies of variable x. Each is displaced by an amount tau, so the top one is unlagged, the second one is lagged by tau, and the blue one on the bottom is lagged by 2 tau. Dickens' theorem says that we should be able to use these three time series as new coordinates and reconstruct a shadow version of the original butterfly manifold. So let's see how this works. This is the reconstructed manifold produced from lags of a single variable, and you can see that it actually does look fairly similar to the butterfly attractor. Each point in the three-dimensional reconstruction can be thought of as a time segment with different points capturing different segments of history of variable x. And the reconstructed manifold is then a library or collection of the historical behavior of x. The reconstruction preserves essential mathematical properties of the original system, such as the topology of the manifold and its Lyapunov exponents. More importantly, this method represents a one-to-one -one mapping between the original manifold, the butterfly attractor, and the reconstruction mx, allowing us to recover states of the original dynamic system by using lags of just a single time series. So, what is really preserved, the most important that is actually preserved uh, between these two, is the fact that um, these, um, is the fact that the shadow manifold and the original manifold are invertible functions of each other. That means they are topologically homeomorphisms or diffeomorphisms. And diffeomorphisms and homeomorphisms are going to explain this way. For example, you cannot make a plate into a mug, but you can make a mug into a donut. So in topology, you could actually convert a mug into a donut, and they're basically the same type of object topological object because you could actually stretch a mug into a donut and vice versa. But because of the hole that you have in the donut or the mug, you cannot convert it into a plate. So the difference between the homeomorphism and the diffeomorphism is that the diffeomorphism has this additional requirement that is differentiable over its entire surface and the entire volume. So you either cannot have these abrupt changes, you cannot jump around. But um, anyway, so this is basically what topology tells you that you actually have the same type of object. This is what you're talking about. It doesn't necessarily mean that it looks the same and like basically and what we think and accommodate being the same. Because we, nobody will ever think that donut and a mug is the same. But for topology, a donut and a mug is the same. So just to review again, Tuckins theorem, since it's so important, if you had a butterfly attractor from the Lorentz attractor, and you had x, y, z, three differential equations, you had the time series projections of them are like individual time series will generate the, the butterfly attractor. You can make a delay embedded manifold which is basically we shift, let's say, variable x, the time series of x by tau, by 2 tau, and we make them the new x, y, and z. And if we project that into phase space, you generate a new manifold, that's the shadow manifold of x, which still has two attractors, like you said, like you see, and it has this these orbits that look similar. So basically, you could take the original Lorentz attractor and stretch it into the delayed um, X shadow manifold of X. All right, so let's try this with some real data. So here are three genes that I collected with uh, by RNA-seq. This basically I sequenced and quantified amount of RNA uh, and took time points of that. And if I take these three genes and I project them into phase space, you will get this manifold, the 
and it's basically does I took these three time series and projected into space and I generate this manifold now you can do the same thing again let's say I take a single one of those genes and took like like cyclin B and the delays of itself and the three of them and then I generated this manifold and then I took swipe 4 generated this manifold and you have like clin 3 and I generate this so basically what you actually had if you compared if you compare these three manifolds of the individual variables what you actually can see you have this big loop around and a little loop around here the loop becomes very very little here but and then you can have this big loop and the loop around here and there like so basically the number of loops that you actually have here is actually preserved the topology is preserved they're just stretched forms of each other so you could actually stretch any one into any other one and actually nearest neighbor or in points that you actually have in phase space would also be preserved and I'll go into that a little bit later you can do this for other things for example this is like uh, Drosophila neuron well the Drosophila voxel is a recorded brain activity uh, optogenetically GCAM6 recorded brain activity and then you can see a single delay uh, manifold out of a time series and this is basically the delay tau is 45 time points and this is the activity of one neurons that was exposed seven times with flashes of light and this is the activity of the neuron projector into phase space so you can see a map and you can see a manifold and this is out of a single uh, a single time series so this is just to show you what kind of maps you get with, with real data. Now, the next technique we're gonna go over is SMAP, and those are sequentially locally weighted global map, linear maps. So why do we want to do this? So the, the goal of this is that we can predict stuff. So if you were to take all the data that you have on a, of a time series to see if you can predict, the, and if the system was linear, then a fitted line would actually give you a pretty good prediction. But what in phase space, the relationship in the two things is very complex. Then you're not gonna do very well. So what you want to do, let's say, if you want to do a linear approximation of that, is like you were taking a tangent of that shape. So remember in the previous ones, I showed you a bunch of manifolds. If you wanted to approximate um, part of the surface of the manifold with a linear map, a hyperplane, instead of a instead of a single line, you would actually have a plane, this is a tangent plane to that to that shape, then you would do a linear approximation. And here I show you. So before I had these two genes, so I four, and this is the manifold that I get. So I would actually make little maps here. If I do a linear approximation just of this segment, that could be that could be, give me a pretty good prediction of the behavior within this region. So if I do it, lots of li little linear maps, I could actually get an approximation of the overall shape just by having a whole bunch of linear maps. But how small do I want to make the segments? So that's the question. So SMAP tells you like how much of an emphasis do I give you the local, the local data versus the global data and how, how much of an emphasis do I give to the local data and that will tell me how big the map, how, how big these segments are for the, for the linear maps. So when you do that, let's say on, on this manifold, let's say this segment or a center on the dark red point, you would actually generate, you're going to give emphasis as the intensity of these red points. So I give a higher emphasis to the ones that are close and less emphasis and the ones that are far away I completely ignore and then you generate oops, basically like a hyperplane and you're gonna predict the behaviors around this point based only on the points that are nearby and that's basically what SMAP does and here I will give you an example of what kind of data you can obtain from this so here we're trying to uh, predict something that looked really really messy which is the number of larvae of this type of it, which is these uh, pomelocentroides, which is a type of you know um, 
small fish that live in reefs. And if you actually look at the the pomacentrate uh, larvae, they come in these pulses, and it seems pretty random, but it's not. So when you actually do this embedding, you see the optimal embedding dimension is around three. So this means that there's at least three factors that are important, but there could be as many as seven by Whitney's embedding theorem. And the prediction of the behavior is pretty good. You see it's like 0.78. That's like uh, the row here gives you basically observes versus expected, your prediction versus versus the actual data, and our accuracy is 0.78. So this is the single variable delay embedding, and this is the attractor that you get. And what you actually see is that if you use the different delays and try to map it onto this, you can see that the best embeddings are percent nighttime illumination. So you take other time series and then work it in. And then basically you try to make other manif uh, manifolds that are for multiple variables with, uh, with SMAP. And then you actually try to see, so the, the percent night illumination lag 19 days. And then we actually have cross shelf wind lag one day and moderate wind speed lag 16 days. So how does this make sense? Well, in the end, this allows us to figure out that illumination lag 19 days was the face of the moon. So the nighttime illumination lag 19 days, but it's telling because they're actually the fish are actually guided by the moon. And when they get out of the reef, they use moonlight to find their way. Cross, well, uh, cross shelf wind lag one day is basically if you have the eggs got distributed by, um, by by one day, basically this is how the eggs were like scattered across the reef. And then moderate wind speeds lag 16 days turn out to be this is when they end up finishing their food. They actually have a yolk sac, is, uh, the, the fish embers have a yolk sac. And 16 days is when they have to start finding their own food so these are the factors that determine and just by using you know the abundance and the dependent of the abundance on the physical factors when you were embedding all those together which ones were giving you the best prediction for the abundance of the of the fish larvae this is basically what allows you to figure out what are the physical factors so you can integrate any time series that you have into a single manifold and that's basically what you use for prediction. And that's what SMAP allows you to do. We'll, we'll, we'll see more of that later. So, okay. So how does the time series look like? So now that you actually have simplex and lag coordinate embedding, here you had a time series of this, of this particular gene. And then you can see this, this thing. And if you embed it, you can see the optimal embedding dimension is somewhere around eight. But the row that you get, observers is predicted, is very close to zero. So this basically has virtually no predictability. So this is really, really bad. The same thing if you do theta, which is basically theta tells you how much of a local bias do you give an SMAP. The predictability is also close to zero. So this is basically a gene which seems to be stochastic, like random. The behavior is random or stochastic, and we cannot predict it. So it has no predictability, so this means that um, we should not use it to make a manifold. If you have a linear signature, then your embedding dimension becomes 1 by simplex, lag coordinate embedding, and your optimal, uh, your optimal theta is 0. So optimal theta 0 means that you actually do not get any bias locally. You take all the data, it's going to give you your best prediction. So this gene is linear. This gene, on the other hand, has an optical embedding dimension of 2. So this is like a nonlinear gene and has a, a non-zero optimal theta where the predictability is highest. And the predictability is pretty good. This is like almost 0.6 for lag coordinate embedding and simplex. And then with, uh, with SMAP, you get above 0.5, 
So this also indicates that this is a nonlinear dynamical signature. Okay, I should talk here of also, um, this is a sort of an aside, and this is about Granger causality. So there are other methods to determine causality. There are methods to determine causality uh, by uh, of time series. But this one is probably the most famous one because uh, Clive Granger, who was actually in the economics department at UCSD, got the Nobel Prize for this. And this is basically a method that works well for certain types of data, but not all data. So Clive Granger had this uh, method, which is called Granger causality. And it's basically, you're going to make a prediction on some event. And you can take all the data points that contain this, and then you're going to and then it says, how well do I predict this? But let's say there's a factor that you suspect is also contributing. So you take all the time points that um, contain the second factor that, you, that you're considering and take all those out. And then you see if the effect goes up or down. If the effect changes or your prediction becomes worse, then you can actually uh, they can actually say that it's causal. He developed this for economics, and it's basically the things that he could actually do the prediction on, let's say, um, on the price of something, and then it would say, and then say like, okay, when a certain policy was there, when a certain law was enacted, versus when this other law was not enacted, and then see if the law actually had an effect on the price of an item. This works for economics because you can have laws that can be there or not there and you can linearly decompose the signal but in systems like either Lorenz attractor or things that are coupled and they're coupled dynamically these things cannot be linearly decomposed so in those cases Granger causality doesn't work so well so as I mentioned like uh, Clive Granger who was in the economics department at UCSD got the Nobel Prize for this. And, you know, Takin's theorem, as I, as I said before, um, has a problem with Granger causality because the condition that you require for a deterministic dynamic system where you can actually subtract a single factor from everything is most of the times not possible because you cannot take it out because it's part of the, you know, if you actually look at it, um, at the equations of the Lorenz attractor, since the since one, let's say you would take one uh, factor out, since the, let's say z, since z is also part of the other equations, you cannot completely take it out because because it's part of the other equation. So that decomposition is simply not possible. Anyway, so therefore, Granger causality doesn't work for dynamical systems. So then, um, in 2012, uh, George Sugihara, the lab where I work with also, um, came up, I mean, I'm, I'm actually at the Salk Institute, but uh, George Sugihara, I've been embedded in his lab for the last three years, um, came up with this method that is called convergent cross-mapping, and convergent cross-mapping can actually deal with this uh, problem of detecting causality in dynamical systems that are coupled. So the general idea is that if X causes Y, then the shadow manifold construct of relax of Y can be used to predict and recover X. So since there are shadow manifolds that you can actually use and each for each of the variables and you can see if they map to each other, you can actually detect how much information is transferred between X and Y. Because if X is causing Y, then Y must contain information about X. And if Y contains information about X, you can know that X is causing Y. So this is the general idea. So if they're actually, if they contain information about of each other, that also means that they are part of the same dynamical system. So like in the Lorentz factor, you have X, Y, and Z. If you actually know that Y contains information of X, and X contains information about Y, it says, okay, they both must belong to the same system, although we don't know anything about Z, for example. So you can have a determination of causality 
based on the things that you have, you don't need to have all the components in order to be able to understand something about causality between the two. So here I'll show you a video that explains this concept again of convergent cross mapping. So as you can see, the, if you actually have one-to-one -one mapping of the original manifold to the shadow manifold, which in this case is like of the variable x, every point that is there in mx also as a point in y, and you actually can generate, uh, see, as you can see, you have the shadow manifold x and you have shadow manifold y. So every point that exists in x also exists in the original manifold and also exists in the shadow manifold y. So these are the same time points. So if you were to actually look at this, and like even if you didn't have the original manifold, by taking each of the shadow manifold, you could actually map each point to each, uh, to each other. You can not only map to the original manifold, you can also map it to each other. What is important here also is the nearest neighbors. So for example, a given, a given point these are the three blue nearest neighbors, and the other one, they're also going to be the nearest, the nearest neighbor. So near points on a particular shadow manifold are also a near point in the other shadow manifold. So this is something that's preserved because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with the different variables. So we can actually use this property in order to, in order to uh, test if these things belong to the same dynamical system. So this is basically the essence of convergent cross mapping. Now I'm going to use the shadow manifold of x to predict y to see if I can do that. And I take the shadow manifold of y to predict x and see if I can do that, to test if they're causally related to each other. So well, this is all about recovery of information. So if x contains information about x, that can be used to predict and recover x. And that's basically, if you take, that's why you need time series because you need the map. And the map is the shadow manifold. Each shadow manifold can be used to predict the shadow manifold or something else. And if they're nearest neighbors on one, they should also be nearest neighbors on the other one and are allowed to have predictability. So that's the essence of convergent cross mapping. And this is just shown again that you can actually have nearest points, with those like equivalent points. They look at kind of different positions. They're just stretch forms of each other, but the nearest neighbors are in, and they have one-to-one -one correspondence. And if you actually do this and see how much predictability you have, so you, if you take, let's say, um, um, if you try to predict with each other, you can actually see um, how much data you've got. So L here is number of data points. And with number of data points and rho is observed versus predicted, you can actually see that it quickly converges. So basically, you actually have the more data you have, the better your prediction is, and then the the better your prediction is because then you, if you have a map that's more dense, then you will actually be better at telling what the nearest neighbors are supposed to be. And the more precise your prediction is, you know, the more the, the better your the better populated your map is, which is your shadow manifold, then the better you predict. And also, um, if you actually have two things, let's say here, like you're talking about the influence of x and y, and y on x, one is asymmetric over the other one. That means this one has a stronger influence. The blue line shows you stronger because it reaches convergence faster. And also the absolute predictability that you can obtain is higher than the other side. So let's see a real case. So this is a predator-prey interaction of paramecium and didinium. Didinium feeds on paramecium, and that's so you can see a picture of those protozoans. And when people actually do a time series of this, and then actually do, you can see that um, the paramecium cross map on didinium basically say, okay, if I take the population of uh, paramecium cross map of didinium because didinium is the predator that feeds on paramecium, 
So the influence of the predator on the prey is stronger than the feedback. So this is also allows you in this particular case to infer who's a predator and who's a prey. But in the end, what you're actually measuring is the influence and who's got a stronger influence on each other. In this case, didanium has a stronger uh, influence on paramecium. The same we can do for the genes that I showed you before. So if we can do the genes SWIFE4 and CLIN3, you can see that it converges with more data points. It, uh, you get better predictability, the cross map skill. And you can see that, uh, that CLIN3 max uh, basically cross maps stronger onto SWIFE4. So that said the transcription of SWIFE4 has a stronger influence on CLIN3 than vice versa. Here is like to show the cross mappings. Uh, here you can actually have something which actually have uh, another gene, the previous gene SWI4 and we 5 You actually have no correlation between, no linear correlation between um, SWI4 and we 5 And you can see from the time series raw data, these things are really uncorrelated. And there's no way you can switch this. It's not a delayed correlation. You cannot shift these two time series around in any way. To make the peaks match. So these are truly uncorrelated. But when you actually do this, we generate a manifold out of these. You can see, let's see, for this blue point here, which is the equivalent time point, the nearest neighbors are these four points. And if you go onto the other manifold, the nearest neighbors are also those points. So this is the way that we're testing with convergent cross mapping. If you actually um, if you actually um, are part of the same dynamical system and therefore causally related. So then you basically you can see that with also with more data points, the library size, meaning how many data points you're using, the more data points you use, the better your map and the better the prediction. So here's another case of something that was a mystery. So in the early 20th century, there was a big fisheries um, industry in Monterey Bay and that's where Canary Row came from. But then in the late 1940s these sardines just disappeared and that was a big mystery and people thought okay here you actually had um, you know the the number of sardines and then really collapsed and people some photos over fishing or something like that other people said like at the same time this other fish anchovies started to come up. So they, oh, they seem to be an inverse correlation and people hypothesized that either the anchovies competed them out or there was some overfishing. People really didn't know. But if we took a look at the time series, we can actually try to the sardines cross mapping onto anchovies and anchovies cross mapping and sardines, the predictability is essentially zero. So you actually don't get anything. So this just means that they're not causing each other to do anything. So the cause of the sardines going down or the anchovies going up was not because of the other fish. But if you actually see that um, if you cross map the sardine onto a sea surface temperature, so sardines will have a strong, uh, uh, you get predictability with more data points. You can see the sea surface temperature is influencing sardines, and, but the reverse is not true. Sardines do not influence the sea surface there's no way they could do that anyways. So it makes no sense and the data actually makes sense. So basically something about the sea surface temperature is influencing the number of sardines and it probably has nothing to do with the anchovies because you can see that from this data. So this was a long standing mystery that was resolved by this technique. You couldn't do an experiment. And here is another time series, and this is basically saying even things that we have some correlation and things, uh, uh, certain things, we can actually get better maps with um, with this. So this is an this is an interaction that we already kind of under knew about from genetics. So these two transcription factors, YOX1 and YHT1, repress this gene called CLIN3, and this is the time series of these uh, three genes. And if we actually plot them in phase space in two dimensions, is a Yox one versus Clin three. The linear, uh, the linear map that we have is this. And each time point, like so, if you you were to try to predict across each other, 
you would do okay certain times, but other times it could be like for example for values of yox one uh, of, for clip three around 110, your values of yox one could be anywhere between zero and 350. So it's not a very good predictor. And actually, this is the R that you have 0 0.57, 0 0.56. This is the uh, the linear map approximation, the prediction. But if you take those two time series, you know, Yox 1 and Clint 3, and add a, three, a third dimension, so plot everything against each other, so we put in phase space, YHP 1, Yox 1, and Clint 3, now this map looks really, really clean. You know, it looks much cleaner. So now you can get much better predictability, and these are the CCM cross map values, just to show here on the left. You can actually see that by just by adding another dimension, we unfolded the manifold. So the singularity started to go away. But there's still some around here. You can see there's some messiness in the map here. And it's not completely unfolded, but it's you know it's doing substantially better. So now it's like this unfolding of the manifold becomes a thing, uh, an important thing. So like when I talk about dimensions before. It's like when you actually add dimensions, you unfold the manifold. So as you unfold the manifold, you remove the singularities and you get a better map and you get a better predictability. And we actually did this. So basically, uh, when we show you, when I show you before, if you actually add dimensions with a single dimension, your your row is 0.72. That's like your observer versus predicted. And then with two dimensions is 0.83 with three dimensions 0.85 and then if you go up to five dimensions you get 0.87 predictability and if you compare to the linear predictors this is observed versus expected with the linear prediction you get a 0.57 uh, with a, with the other gene you can actually get a linear map you get like a, <coughs> a 0.44 and with a nonlinear prediction you do much better so you can see it's closer to the diagonal. This is observed versus predicted. How? But what we actually did is basically take, let's say, we're trying to predict clean three. So we took like YHP1 and YOX1. And then what we also did is like, um, then we try, try to do it with, let's say, with YHP1, YOX1, and clean three, because these are the only three genes that we know, plus you know, two delays of YML027. So basically you actually do the same, you, you take the original plus, you know, lagged, um, uh, lagged uh, time series of itself. So you can combine lagged time series, real time series in any way, and then whatever gives you more prediction gives you more information on how the system is actually working. So here I, I have a graphical example of how the manifold. So let's say you have three variables here, x, y, z, and there's like a three component manifold, and here are the nearest neighbors. Then I took just x, and then you the black coordinate using Takin's theorem, just to use the um, shadow manifold of x. This is what you get. But here, let's say you have, you know, X and Y, these are the only observables that you have, you only have time series of those. But you can use X and Y, and then you can use X and Y and X minus tau. So this is the lagged tau. So by having a lagged tau together with the real time series, you can actually generate a better prediction that's closer to the real thing. So the point is that you can use a combination of real time series and lag time series in order to get better predictability. So here's another case of this empirical dynamical modeling. So a typical way here is basically used on salmon in the Pacific Northwest in Canada, in the Fraser River salmon. And basically what you're trying to predict is the, uh, the number of recruits. The number of recruits means the number of fish that uh, that uh, that you that that, uh, that come back, and spawners are like the number that basically the number of fish that got 
um, that got born when they came out of the river and how many actually came back is what you're trying to predict. And this is the sea surface temperature. So a traditional Ricker model is basically, um, doesn't matter what it is, you generate a hyperplane. And this is equation based and you just generate an equation and you try to fit it to all the data points that you have depending on basically spawners, this data that you have, the number of, of uh, eggs that hatch and become uh, young fish and then sea surface temperature relationship and then you try to predict the number and you fit the data that you have. If you were to do the same with empirical dynamical modeling, you don't use an equation. You take every data point and you make a surface, you make a surface just with the data points that you have. So you fit this, you, basically you take the data as it is and this is the surface that you have. And then you, based on this surface that you generate, you start predicting. And actually you do pretty good. So if you actually see the observed versus predicted, you know, it's not perfect, of course, it's not magic, but this is based on the data that you have, you know, how well you're predicting. And actually, this prediction was better for last year, it was better than the one that uh, Canada Fisheries could come up. Just basically taking the complexity, because we don't know all the things that go into, um, that go into salmon being suspect, successful coming back to breed, but we have certain observables and we use this type of empirical dynamical modeling in order to predict how uh, how these things are working and we just take the raw data that have hidden data of hidden variables in there and we just don't care what they are we just use the lags to allow us to predict better Would, all that that tells you is that there are more things there and how many of them you get sort of an estimate of how many there are. So here is something that was thought to be random. For example, this is a, uh, an ES cells. This is this gene called nano that exists in ES cells. And sometimes you have this high expressing and sometimes low expressing. In fact, you have these two populations, you know, um, low expressors and high expressors. And we thought, uh, people say this is a random process. And we took some time-lapse imaging of individual cells, how these things go up and down. And what you see here is like we take this time lapse and then we use the single targets embedding shadow manifold of nano. And people thought that this was kind of uh, was thought to be random. But for example, if it gets close to this side, we can say, oh, now it's going to go dark. So it looks messy. And this is a, and you can see this like uh, when it comes here, you get, oh, I know it's going to go dark. And within a couple cycles, within a couple time points. And the fact that we can predict something out of it, this tells us that this is probably not random because if we can predict something, that means that it's like it has some predictability and it's probably something that is chaotic and not completely random. And the, this manifold looks messy probably because at least five dimensional. So our embedding dimension is five, so this means that at least this must be at least five dimensional and it could be as many as 11 dimensional in the real life. So this is pretty much it. So okay, so just to acknowledge, I've, I've been embedded uh, with uh, George Sugihara's lab for the last three years and uh, the grad students, now postdocs, they both graduated, Howie and Ethan Dale helped me out a lot. I've been doing experiments with Kurt Wittenberg at the TSRI, and I had from uh, help imaging from the uh, Salk Imaging Core, and I'm in the lab of Inder Verma and Eugene Key, um, actually uh, helping with bioinformatics. Jeremy Huang helping with imaging quantification, and Nina Tano and Joko Gawa with molecular biology. I'm funded by uh, Helmsley, and my take-home message is that. You have to remember that correlation is neither necessary nor sufficient for causation if the system is nonlinear and complex. And I encourage people to take time series of stuff if the system is dynamic and it's not in equilibrium and static. And you should take time series data, although it's sometimes more difficult. I guess for neuroscientists it's a little bit easier. And uh, this is a picture of George Sugihara, who is the 
uh, person that I learn all this stuff from. Okay, um, and uh, resources, um, additional resources for uh, empirical dynamic modeling um, will be uh, passed out by Katie, I guess. Okay, thank you.